What up, snitches? I'm the Animaniac, and I'm back with my 250 subscriber special. Yeah, I know it's been a while since I passed it, but I wanted to get other stuff done first before tackling the milestone. Along with that, I've been working on future videos that'll come after this one. So, to celebrate 250, I'm paying a visit to Great Lakes City to talk about the Casa Grandes. The spin-off of The Loud House, it ran on Nickelodeon from 2019 to 2022 for a total of 70 episodes over three seasons. It follows the day-to-day -day lives of the Santiago's and the Casa Grandes living together in an apartment building in Great Lake City. A little reminder that, that if you'd like to see these videos early, subscribe to me on Rumble. The link is in the description and pinned comment below. I'm not going to mention another sub goal, nor will I tell you to sub to this channel as I'm over 500 and I have yet to figure that milestone out. But as I was working on this video, I posted my thoughts on the episodes to shows I'm looking at on my community page. So there's something to check out. I had talked about the first 10 episodes of the first season in early 2020. It was an approach I took with a handful of recent cartoons then. There will come times where I'll revisit them. I retired that idea. What helped me with that decision was this comment on the video. This is the kind of comment I'd like to see more of on my videos. The kind from people who want to see me get better. I've looked over the whole show and I'm ready to pick it apart. But let's see how we got here. The story of the Casa Grandes doesn't begin in October 2019, but in May of 2017. By this point, the Santiago's, Ronnie Ann, her brother Bobby, and their overworking mother Maria, established themselves as recurring characters on the Loud House. However, in the Season 2 episode, Loudest Mission Relative Chaos, is where things change forever for Miss Santiago. While visiting the Casa Grandes in Great Lakes City, her mother is planning on moving her family there because since she often works double shifts at the hospital and her brother Bobby works a lot of part-time jobs around Royal Woods, Ronnie Ann is often left home alone. So Maria wants to get them on board with this move so she can have peace of mind that she's around family. This is despite the fact that Ronnie Ann is okay being on her own. So the Casa Grandes, who all found out after Maria told Frida, do their best to convince them that moving is a good idea. In one shot of this episode, we are introduced to the Casa Grandes. Hector is the owner of the store near their apartment building who often gossips with his customers and neighbors. And Rosa, in her intro, tends to their apartment. She's always making meals, home remedies for sick kids that they dread, and believing in superstitious nonsense. Another thing that happens as she's feeding Ronalda, her attempt to cover up her response to wanting to move by acting like she now has a fever, and gets her to her remedies. Notable thing about Rosa is that she's voiced by Sonia Manzano. That's right, Maria from Sesame Street. She came out of retirement for this role. And Hector during this time was very open to Bobby's business ideas from his time in multiple part-time jobs. His way to try and win him over was to offer him taking the bodega when he retires. And after I retire. Sure, kid. Now get ready for bed. I think your mom has your feety pajamas. Oh, mommy! Next is Ronnie Ann's uncle Carlos, a college professor who is seen spouting out random facts that have no bearing on the episode or even serve as an adequate joke. He doesn't have much to do in his first appearance. His wife Frida, however, does, as she's often seen taking photos of situations without proper context, and would break out into happy tears every time in this episode alone. Their daughter, Carlota, is a thrifty fashionista who pulls Ronnie Ann away from the group heading down to the bodega to dress up. She knows her audience very well. And her trying to make Ronnie wear girlier clothing would continue for one more episode before dropping it. Like with Rosa, Carlota is played by Alexa Penavega of Spy Kids Notoriety, joining her husband, Big Time Rush member Carlos Penavega, who plays Bobby. And I wish I could say her performance was the shit-talking mushrooms, but it gave me nothing to talk about. Their first middle child, CJ, is a boy with Down syndrome who likes pirates, voiced by an actual dude with Downs. I wish I had more to say, but I don't. Their second middle child, Carl, in 
this period of the show at least, is someone who thinks is hot stuff and is always trying to gain the affections of Bobby's girl, Lori. There's perhaps one moment where the writers got something actually funny out of this. Greetings, my lovely gazelle! Nice. Unfortunately, this was the only one before they dropped his pursuit of Lori. And their youngest, Carlitos, is a baby who mimics the other family members and acts like a cute baby. Unlike Lily, there is thankfully not as many dirty nappies with him. And then there are the family pets. First a parrot named Sergio who talks in complete sentences. Upon introduction, it's shown he had a hatred for Bobby that's never elaborated on. As Ronnie Ann and Lori are trying to get Bobby on board the idea of staying in Royal Woods by feeding him a cookie laced with a love potion, Sergio steals it and ends up falling in love with Bobby. And that didn't last long either. And finally, there's their big lovable dog, Lalo. I got nothing for him. I've already pointed these out, but the Casa Grandes' approach to winning over the Santiago brood was showing them what would be open to them. It works well with Bobby down in the bodega, given the knowledge he accumulated from work experience. Not so much with Ronnie Ann when she was around Carlota and Rosa. Their attempts to influence her and cover up why they're doing it come off as stupid for not knowing who they're appealing to, and short-sighted, not realizing their cover-ups are making them look crazy. On the day they were supposed to head home, CJ proudly let slip that they're all moving here. Ronnie Ann ain't loving this, while everyone else is. When she tells Lincoln and Lori about this, Lori furiously drives over with Lincoln in tow. With her help, Ronnie Ann gets to work to convince her brother to stay in Royal Woods. When Lori talking to him doesn't work, funny how she's exhausted after listening to Bobby talk about work when she can talk for hours herself, they try more devious methods. Carlota gives Lori a makeover. It gets ruined by Carl hitting on her and being made a mess. Lori recreates a dinner date from her favorite reality show, The Dream Boat. She frames it as their favorite show. He believes it, unfortunately, when he says this earlier in the episode. This is Lori's favorite show, and so it's mine too. From what I remember, she refused to go with him to a monster truck show, passing the spare ticket to Lincoln. This moment makes me think he's losing himself and becoming part of her, and I don't like it. There will come a day where I'll take a look at the Loud House again. Anyway, the dreamboat thing doesn't work because of a work issue. And finally, she and Ronnie Ann find a love potion in Ronnie Ann's grandparents' room to put into a cookie for Bobby to eat. That fails when Sergio steals it and falls in love with Bobby. Bobby manages to get away from Sergio to explain how a long-distance relationship can work, and that they'll attend the same local uni in Great Lakes City in a year. That doesn't happen when she goes to another university on a golf scholarship. With no one to support her, Ronnie Ann talks to her mum about not wanting to move. When it seems like the Santiago's are staying in Royal Woods, Ronnie Ann discovers the Casa Grandes have converted the overstuffed storage closet into a bedroom for her to sleep in, with a mini fridge and photos of friends and family. Thanks to this gesture, Ronnie Ann agrees to stay with the Casa Grandes, and Lincoln tells her about the fourth wall she can talk to. This is never used again. Since then, the Casa Grandes have made a handful of appearances in Season 3. And a few months before they were set to premiere, the first nine episodes of Season 4 were dedicated to them. My opinion on this move hasn't changed. I don't think this was a decision that screams confidence in a new product. It looks like the Casa Grandes are using the Loud House as a crutch in this case. It didn't work well as the ratings went down during this period and went back up when they focused on the Louds. Another notable change was Ronnie Ann's actress. Brianna Yah was replaced with Isabella Alvarez. The new voice actress doesn't have the rasp Brianna has with her. Ronalda has adjusted to life with the Casa Grandes and Great Lake City very well. She even made friends which this batch of episodes forget they exist. Or along with Lincoln, she didn't tell Bobby about them either. And she is given a new interest, or two if her interest in skateboarding is new, Lucha Libre, with her favorite wrestler being La Tormenta. The majority of the Casa Grandes have a few changes and expansions. Frida has expanded into other mediums as an artist and would contribute pieces for a local museum. And her crying causes floods. Carlos, when the show premiered, used to be a skateboarder in his college days, something that's barely touched upon throughout the series. 
Near the end, they devote an episode to his rivalry with the man who caused the injury that ended his skateboarding career, Tony Hawk, who was 53 when that episode aired, yet the animators made him look much younger. Carlos dropping random facts would mostly be dropped. Carlota's interest in fashion became more contemporary, and she became a social media influencer with a channel where she streams makeup tutorials. She would later befriend a pop star voiced by former Fifth Harmony member, Allie Brook, who also did the theme song. Not a lot is explored with her during the series, though if this is how she approaches attracting someone... If you want someone to like you, the key is to act uninterested. Take Diego, for example. I've been ignoring him for the past 45 minutes. I think I'm good on her. You let me know how that works out for you when you're 40, little lady. Carl has now obtained the attitude of an aspiring entrepreneur with crooked schemes. They were able to mine a bit of gold from it in the beginning. Give me 10 bucks, I'll find him. Nice doing business with you. Carl! Like that. His schemes would often come back on him. He also enjoys trains with boxers adorned with them, and worships a superhero named El Falcon, who is Batman without the personal tragedy and brooding, and He-Man without being made into gay joke fodder. Ironic how a superhero is being worshipped by a crooked little troll the show will occasionally make people feel sorry for. Maria's work stories in the ER end up grossing out a few family members, most notably Carlota and Carl. And she and Carlos act occasionally like children when she teases him. That's it for her, really. She still keeps up working double shifts at the hospital. Man, the kid's new school tuition fees must be staggering. There is someone new introduced during this time. Her ex-husband and Ronnie Ann and Bobby's father, Arturo. A name that retcons this moment from the Loud House. Roberto Alejandro Martinez Mian Luis Santiago Jr. Arturo is a doctor who spent so much time in Peru setting up a hospital there, until he moves to Great Lake City. He does call Ronnie Ann from time to time, yet when he does come around for a half hour special, there are two character reactions that don't get revisited often in the show's life. Hector staring daggers, and Carlos having a man crush on him that makes him do foolish things, like wear something an old Peruvian lady wears. Moments like these make me wonder how much material the writers were able to mine from these qualities. Rosa is said to be the apartment building manager. When the kids aren't doing what she wants them to, or just being naughty in general, she threatens them with her jandal. When she does that when someone asks her a genuine question, like about the Day of the Dead, that makes her look like she has no answers and is too proud to admit that. And lastly, she watches an astrology show hosted by someone played by George Lopez, where his predictions are often... right? In unexpected ways. Anything to avoid feeling crazier than normal, I guess. The new thing about Hector is he calls people Bobos, like Bobby. I guess he's been around him long enough to know what he's like. The mystic Rosa likes or anything that captivates other people. And whenever he thinks something or someone is dumb, he already looks pretty foolish himself. And Sergio is now a selfish, restless party animal. Very obnoxious to watch. <laughs> hey, Priscilla, dump me! Again! <laughs> oh, wait, you serious? Let me laugh even harder. <laughs> I'll put you away for later and move on to the introduction of the show using more Spanish. The Casa Grandes uses more Spanish starting in Season 4 of The Loud House, and more references to Central and South American culture, using family terms... Abuelo, Abuela, Tio Carlos, Tia Frida... Replacing Bodega with Mercado, watching telenovelas and Lucha Libre wrestling. When these changes happen, it feels a bit sudden, but alright. I guess they needed something to lean on after taking up the Loud House's screen time. Also during this time, we're introduced to Sid Chang, Ronnie Ann's new best friend and next door neighbor. A very enthusiastic, smart, easily distracted little lady. She and Ronnie Ann become fast friends when they first meet. She even introduces Ronaldo to K-pop through 12 is Midnight. The genre in real life are currently the next phase for boy and girl bands. They're going away from the US and UK and heading to Korea to reinvigorate those types of groups. 
we also meet her family, the Changs. Her father, Stanley, is a subway train driver voiced by Ken Jeong, who isn't given material that he can make funny, and occasionally drives a tour tram cart for his missus at the zoo. Her mother, Becca, is a zookeeper who has a strong rapport with the animals at Great Lakes City Zoo. She's voiced by Melissa Joan Hart of Nickelodeon's Carissa Explains It All. In fact, this is her first gig with Nick since 1994. While Sid's parents don't give me a lot to work with, her sister Adelaide did. She likes her pet frog Hoppy so much that she cried when he died, one of the better episodes of the show in its early age. Her pretend tea parties with her stuffed animals, she has a love for fairy tales, and is very good at karate, something that Carl resented about her. Now, for the meat that is the show. The Casa Grandes has the same animation style as the Loud House. On a side note, those characters make several appearances throughout the show, but they use cityscapes in their scene transitions. Sure. And occasionally there would be a character who looks to be taken from the animatic and colored, like a level that's in between that and what is expected to be the finished design. That quality. The rest of the time, it's fine. I have recognized three types of humor in the Casa Grandes. Slapstick, toilet humor, and puns. The extent of the toilet humor is farts, dirty nappies, occasional animal feces, toilet water sprayed everywhere, and Hector in his drawers. I remember a couple of times where the use of farts felt different than making others cringe at it. Ronnie Ann not reacting to the smell of Lalo's fart pillow when preparing for a scheme, and CJ using his own gas to fly when trick-or-treating as Hector. Yes, that happens. Loaded nappies only elicit cringe and disgusted reactions. The animal excrement is rare but kind of surprising given that this is a Nickelodeon cartoon. What dog dung is seen is styled like a soft serve swirl. Then there are instances of pigeon crap. And there's the time Sergio's was green like guacamole, even to the point of using guac to simulate parrot feces. Like the loaded nappies, the animal poop elicits mostly a grossed out reaction. If not from the other characters, then maybe from the audience when the characters don't know what it really is. The puns are pretty frequent, but I'm not amused by them. I find their frequency so confusing. It makes me think the writers have a dad joke sense of humor, and the people watching must not have a problem with it. I don't know, you tell me. Sorry you had a bad Halloween, but... At least you tried something new. That took good. <laughs> Can you believe first time competitor CJ has made it to the final round? It's a true Spinderella story. <laughs> you can feel the spin intensity in the air. <laughs> Tough break, literally. CJ is double spinning with the proper side pieces. Oh, it's spin-tastic. Hey, that guy stole my purse. You just made a big mistake. Now that's what I call a swan song. I'm, I'm sorry! Puns are a part of my job! Rita and Carlos went to that big art and music festival, Burning Plum. And she's holding auditions for a dog sidekick. The slapstick here is very straightforward. It's a means to put sympathy onto characters that are likable and put tension into the episodes. It's also a swift punishment for characters like Hector, Carl, Sergio, or anyone who acts out of line. In this case, it's the most cathartic. Or just for Lair to get hit. The show might not need a reason to do it. Maybe it doesn't like him. Dork. I had binge watched the whole show twice, so because of how basic they are, they became easy to predict and quickly stopped being funny. Even the prank episode doesn't have a lot of creativity in its slapstick. Perhaps those who saw it did. I've been able to boil down my issues with the Casa Grandes into six categories. The first is them forcing a comedic setup, either for a joke or to progress the plot. Going overboard sees Carlos breaking his leg when he falls on his back after skateboarding. Later, he would drag the curtain and rod down on Frida's trampoline calculator exhibit. Either that's a real heavy curtain and rod, or she used some flimsy materials to make the installation. When they're haunted by a ghost rooster, as they're all watching wrestling, Carl and CJ get into it on the couch, blocking Ronnie Ann's view of the TV. 
The episode also shows there's plenty of room on the floor for them to do it. When Carl, CJ, and Carlitos are stuck with a babysitter so Carlos and Frida can enjoy their anniversary, Carlos is nowhere to be seen for the rest of the episode. Did she have something to do on that day? Can I see that instead of these three mingers? When Rosa was worried about Mama Lupe keeling over from her grandkids not continuing Mexican traditions, we get a shot of the kids watching The Dream Boat, a show that hasn't been with the Casa Grandes since season two of The Loud House. Moments like these make me think that these stories should have had more time spent on tweaking, like maybe another week to weed out the stupid and refine the present and or come up with better jokes. They also have a tendency to repeat certain jokes and their delivery over and over to the point they're powder. I honestly don't know what other way they can be told. Carl getting pantsed, exposing that he has trains on his boxers, later would be El Falcon, but it's still the same joke. If jokes are repeatedly delivered the same way too often, its impact will keep lessening until it becomes annoying. Show, we did a drawing and gave it a voice. Now care, and them. How about no? This one has a few sections to it as there are different reasons to not care about a character's plight. The Casa Grandes touts that the apartment building they live in has an assortment of quirky characters. Really, let's run through them. Mr. Nakamura was a guy dealing with a dog with behavioral problems. Then his toilet was always clogged and then has quirky antiques like classic toys and a clown memorabilia collection. Not everybody appreciates it. He basically doesn't have a personality and changes interests when it appears the writers run out of joke material. His son Corey is an insomniac gamer who doesn't show up a lot in the show. Mrs. Kernicki is the athletic geriatric and fills roles reflecting that. I don't know what the hell Maria's about as a character. Alexa is an innocent boy who plays the tuba in a school band, and I don't know what his mum is about either apart from having a dog who eats everything. Vito is only an old Italian man with two wiener dogs with gangster names, with the other notable thing about him is he's Hector's best friend. These quirky characters' traits aren't very quirky, and these characters don't have a lot in terms of personality. That's one reason to not care about someone. Though characters like Maria, CJ, and Carlos, I like a lot, don't have a lot to them, I got behind them just fine. The same couldn't be said about characters who got a few seconds minimum in one episode and then a season or two later, they're the focus that's meant to be cared about, like Paco and his minging looking bride. He got a half hour episode, by the way. This can be extended to relationships like what happened with Carlota and Alyssa. If they wanted Carlota sticking up for her to be very impactful, there needed to be a few more episodes to help give that moment the emotional weight it needs. Or in what is the Casa Grande's funniest joke? Them getting who watch them to sympathize with road apples. Carl and Sergio, I found, fall into this category. I covered why taking pity on these two doesn't work on my worst episode countdown a few weeks ago. So the short version for them is, you two are unapologetically awful, not in a funny way, I don't feel bad for you, you suck, bugger off. After adventuring through what the Casa Grandes had to offer in their three season run, there is one thing I can think of that would have given the show more potential for heart and hijinks. Show the characters lives outside of their family more. The Loud House understood by the end of their first season that if it was going to be around for a while, it needed to be about more than just Lincoln navigating a household with ten sisters. It expanded to be about them and their parents too. The show had some potential that they didn't tap into for more stories and humor. Sid's journey into skateboarding when she was pulled into Ronnie Ann's skate team is one that could have done with more digging like trying to learn a cool trick or a smooth or techy line to impress her friends. Something like that doesn't happen and she's shown to confidently shred a half pipe and getting massive air off them. Ronnie Ann's journey in skateboarding could have served as a good story to have in the show as well. 
The friendship between Bobby and Pa, the fruit delivery guy, is given some screen time after they're put together. I just wish they devoted more time to this duo. Anything to keep Bobby from being everyone else's punching bag again. The Casa Grandes has been selective about what parts of their history they ignore, acknowledge, and follow up on. Apart from Bobby's dad named Arturo, the Casa Grandes don't revisit a lot of the events that happened. Quite a few of them seem to have potential to be continued and taken into new territories, potentially even new heights. Like Vito had been given a robot as a roommate after his son went off to uni. Those two weren't seen again until season 3. Ronnie Ann and her friends still hang out and skate, but their team and the coach who had doubts about skating isn't mentioned until season 3, minus the coach. Hector finishing school isn't continued, sticking to the little Snorlax, he was hypnotized by his family to stop gossiping. But when he can't talk when the family really need him to, they decide to overload him with gossip. The last time the show used hypnotism, it was shown Bobby couldn't become a cat after hitting his head falling on the floor. The baby birds Sergio spent a day looking after make a few more appearances after that, but he doesn't see them again. Maybe the writers couldn't chisel out a story from elements like these. Another reason for more time given to the writers, and remembering what happened before Cut the Cheese Mane. Where it works in its favor is with Ronnie Ann's favorite wrestler, La Tormenta. In the first nine episodes of The Loud House's fourth season, Ronaldo faked being sick to stay home and watch what was supposed to be Tormenta's retirement match. I'm not upset about her continuing to wrestle after this, since some wrestlers do come out of retirement for one more run. Terry Funk, Mick Foley in TNA, Ric Flair, Lita, Tris Stratus, Adam Copeland, Christian Cage, Shawn Michaels, and CM Punk, among others. Whether those runs were good and or advisable is irrelevant here. What stuck around for the show's whole run is Sid's robot, Breakfast Bot, Frida's relationship with the local art gallery, and Arturo coming back to be a recurring local, not on video call. Those are the ones that come to mind in this category. I found the Casa Grandes to be very boring, stupid, and unfunny. There isn't enough meat on the characters' bones to be entertaining. They've made some baffling choices when it came to them and its continuity. I'm surprised it went on for as long as it did. In 2022, it was reported the Casa Grandes had been cancelled, ending the show after three seasons. In the following year, it was announced they'll be getting a Netflix movie to serve as the series finale for 2024. It's already been out by the time this review is out. The family will continue to make sporadic appearances for The Loud House in the meantime and onwards. I'll have to see how that fares when I look at The Louds in the future. If you guys enjoyed the video, leave a like, comment your own thoughts on the show. If you guys want to stay updated on future videos, be sure to follow me on Getter, Twitter, and DeviantArt. The links are in the description. And if you want to be the first to know when a new video will be up, ring that bell after you subscribe. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you guys next time.